Uh, okay. Um, well, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. I know everybody is insanely busy um, in the run up to Christmas. So um, I just want to sort of take us through a couple of ways that I try and engage the students that I teach in scholarship and a couple of the ways in which I try and blend scholarship into the actual specification and sort of the narrative that we are supposed to teach. Um, I really like things to be sort of interactive so if you do have any questions please do chuck them in the chat I, I you know I would like to talk these things through um, at the end but what I'm going to do is share my screen and we can sort of go along you know with the various methods that I use hold on share uh, and if you if, if Grandi, you could let me know if you can see it and it's all working that would be great because it's just shrunk everybody down to small okay um, so hopefully we can all see uh, the first slide of PowerPoint. Um, the first thing I want to say is is a bit of a, a bit of a disclaimer. Okay, um, right. Some things here just very quickly. Um, I'm not intending to sort of get on my soapbox and say this is the way and the only way to teach scholarship is this. So you know, it's it's not sort of a sermon from the mount type thing. I'm just sort of suggesting a, a few a few ways that you can integrate scholarship in your classes, in your lessons. Um, I also don't want to suggest to you all today that this is the like the foolproof way of teaching scholarship and that, you know, um, if you don't do it this way, it's not going to work. Um, what I would also say is I, I'm not here. I'm not here to to bash OCR in any way um, or, or, you know, sort of suggest they're not doing scholarship in the right way. I'm just here to sort of say, these are the ways that we can use scholarship more effectively and make sure our students can use them more effectively. Also, not everything suggested today will work for all of you, nor will it work for every student that you have. Um, so some things you'll probably find quite useful. Some things you'll think, actually, I don't think that will work for my cohort or in the way that, that Danny's got it sort of set up here and and please you know do do put in the chat if you feel that you know actually it could it could be done like this or could we do it like that so we can have sort of a more uh, co collaborative uh, sort of thing going on okay so first things first the issue the issue and and you know having having been part of sort of various uh, groups and things like that and seeing what people think about scholarship in various subjects and in particular classics and ancient history the idea i think is that the use of scholarship can be quite overwhelming for a level three course, you know, for, for, for an AS uh, in, in terms of Wales or, or an A2 um, course, but for you guys, it's linear. Um, and the, the concerns really are, what are the demands placed on us as the lecturers? You know, how much scholarship should we know? Um, how much scholarship should we engage with? But then also, how are the learners supposed to engage with that scholarship? You know, how many articles are they supposed to have read? How many books are they supposed to have read? Um, you know, how many points can they raise on any issue that may come up? And this is, you know, this is all quite quite big stuff, all quite demanding stuff. Um, but I think the key thoughts are this, how much scholarship is too much scholarship? And how do I best use scholarship so that it's meaningful to my learners? So, you know, okay, Joe Bloggs has 15 different quotes in his head from, um, you know, scholars of the ancient world. If he doesn't know how to deploy them, he could have 115 quotes. It doesn't really make much difference. If he doesn't know how to use them for an essay, for an exam, it doesn't much matter. So that's the key thing. Not, not how many can you remember, but what can you do with the stuff that you know? OK, that's what I want to try and get at um, today for us all. OK, so um, really what, what you get is sort of this. Um, and sometimes you feel quite frazzled saying, right, include scholarship. Um, it's difficult for us to know where to begin. It feels a bit like I think this image here, we've all seen, you know, this this image uh, online and we've all felt like it, I think, at certain times. Um, if we focus on and what I think is important is this red thread. And I talk about the red thread a lot. The idea that it runs through all of our scholarship all our teaching, you know, it's built into our schemes of work. It's what we want the students follow um, and if we if we have a red thread for scholarship it makes it more manageable um, what I want to get across is that scholarship should be part of our narrative 
not as an addition or a bolt-on concept to our narrative. Um, I have always felt that we are professional storytellers. Now, you, you, might, you might decry that and say, no, 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 I, I don't see it like that. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. But I see us as storytellers. We, we love a story. We love the narrative. We love what happens in the periods that we study. That's why, that's why we do it. Otherwise, we'd go and do something else. Um, and so actually weaving the scholarship into the narrative is, I think, the best way to get the most out of it for us and for our students. Um, how do you do that? Well, there's quite a few different ways to do that. And on the slides that follow, I'm going to break down some of the ways that I try and keep the red thread steady and have the scholarship as part of that red thread. OK, and if any of these ideas appeal to you or if any of these uh, resources appeal to you, I'm obviously very happy to, to share them and talk about them and, and, and uh, sort of take the time to, to go through them in, in more detail. So the specification actually provides us with an opportunity to weave scholarship into the narrative. OK, so I picked one here, which is one we teach at A2, um, belief and ideas in the Roman Republic. And this allows you the use of the primary sources as a way to construct a narrative. And by doing that, you can use scholarship. Um, it doesn't feel forced or bolted on. And a good example is, is, is in Verum 1 1. OK, so, so against Verres um, 1. OK, it's primary source. It's listed as a primary source. You can get it as a 10 marker on the belief and idea source question for the passage. But it's also a really good way of including your scholarship into um, the narrative. Um, for example, if I just scroll down, put it there. No, yes, I did. Hold on. Uh, yeah. So what we've got here, for example, is this idea. I use this a lot. It's called the conceptual grid. It's in the wrong place in my PowerPoint now, but never mind. Um, it's called the conceptual grid. And what, what you do is you have your key actors, your key players, your key scholars, however you want to do it. There's lots of different ways to do it. And you, you basically put their names in here. So Cicero, Pompey, Verres, Metelli, Hortensius. And so you, you use this while you're going through the trial of Verres, for example, while you're going through the narrative with them, while you're going through the speech with them. And you say, right, OK, at the end, there's a sort of summary how do I build up the knowledge of the students about this particular concept? And what you've got is you've got the people, so they need to know about the people. And around the people, you put different things. So Cicero prosecuted Verres for extortion in 70. It's very useful for Cicero to prosecute. He's hoping to benefit his political career. So that's basic knowledge that the students should have. In these boxes, though, you can take the evidence from Verres's, uh, from the speech against Verres, but you can also put in the scholarship. So we're, we're, I, want, I want people to weave the scholarship into the narrative. So what are they saying in, in the speeches and what, um, what scholarship can we use to sort of tie this together? So, so they're a bridge, if you like. They're a bridge to one another. So in here, for example, you take some evidence from the speech, which obviously your students have been working on with you and you'd add some scholarship as well um, you know and, and you, you sort of take them through that as you go and you might say well how, you know how do you do that um, you know I've seen suggestions that you basically give them an article and you say right let's run with it we'll give them a whole article to look at I'm going to go out on a limb and I say I don't think that's the way to do it I think that produces cognitive overload I think that the student thinks oh my god it's a whole article what am I going to do with this and obviously there'll be references in that article which they might not understand. And so this, this sort of produces a bit of, mm, I'm not sure I can do this and I'm, I'm gonna sort of shy away from it. So what you should do is have sort of bite-sized chunks of scholarship that you can use and tie them together. So like in these boxes, you'd have evidence from the speeches. You'd also have bits of scholarship that you could work in. On the next slide, I'll show you um, just some of the small bits of scholarship that you could put in. It doesn't need to be a lot. The mark scheme says you've got to refer to two scholars. It doesn't say that you, you know, you should have reams and reams of scholarship. You just want the scholarship 
on which to pin your argument, to hang your argument and say, actually, I agree with this. I don't agree with this. You know, um, you, you can look at this and actually the evidence doesn't support it. Or you can look at this and the evidence does. So it, it's the it's the foundation maybe on which your argument is is laid. But the majority of your argument should be from our sources, you know, um, or from what we call like AO1, which I always call the stuff that you know. OK, so this is, you know, how it would work. You'd have this here, which is the next slide. So I've got the opening of one page from uh, Beard and Crawford um, about the fall of the Roman Republic. And it's about challenging Hortensius, who was Verez's lawyer, uh, defending lawyer for the trial, the extortion trial in which Cicero prosecuted. So there's a small little bit here. You know, it's, it's basically a paragraph and it just gives you some background, you know, some scholarship that you can use to sort of underpin what's going on um, at the time. OK, um, in order to sort of be a bit more detailed about Cicero's career and the links between the, you know, all of the people and what's going on, you know, I've got Beard here um, and this is from SPQR, which is um, a sort of whistle stop tour through the history of the Roman Republic. Um, it's very accessible. It's very fast paced. Uh, Beard covers a lot of ground, you know, reasonably quickly, but in a way which doesn't terrify students. So I've put the page numbers on there, but I've also got the quote itself. And so you can use some of these um, in your boxes in, in the conceptual grid above. Um, you know, the case launched Cicero's career. Um, as he spectacularly defeated the established lawyers and orators lined up in Verus's defence. So, you know, if you've got a question where you're talking about, you know, how important was the trial of Verus for Cicero's career? How important was, you know, his political oratory in his career? How important was his ability to go against the grain on occasion? The, you know, these are quotes that you can weave in. You know, you've already got the narrative from the speeches. You can drop some scholarly quotes in there. Um, and, and you can really think about, you know, what that means for your argument. OK, um, you know, the, the one below that one, um, we talk about Cicero exaggerating the wickedness of Verez and there are all kinds of cracks in his argument. So actually, you know, is it is Beard suggesting or can you can can you go from that and say, actually, well, you know, Cicero's bravery is an important political tool, for example. It's not just, you know. He's got the brain the size of a planet and, and, he, and he's, a, he's a very good orator. He's actually got other political qualities. So, you know, if you've got a Verez question, you could use this. But actually, it can be used for more things. If you're talking about Cicero's political acumen, if you're talking about, you know, the way in Cicero will take a calculated risk or a gamble, these sort of scholarship sort of quotes here will help you build different arguments. And that's very important. You've got to take your quotes and you've got to make them applicable to varying scenarios so that they're there for you to, to sort of pick up, um, depending on what the questions may or may not be when the exam comes around. OK, so th this is just one idea. And, you know, the conceptual grid helps with all sorts of um, things. It also helps with like narrative flow and what happens when and to who and all that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, you've got one for Verres, but you could easily have one for the first triumvirate. You could easily have another for, for um, you know, the, the, the slide to civil war between Pompey and Caesar. And, you know, you can build the forces, but also the scholarship. OK, so the conceptual links grid is something that the students find quite helpful. And, you know, they colour it in. They do it in different colours. They do it in different fonts. They, 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 they make it their own. You know, they download it from from the, the, the sort of classroom site that we use and, and, they, and they make it their own and they add their, their quotes and all that sort of thing. So that's one, thing I, that's one thing I use. And I think that's, you know, there are, as I say, multiple different ways that you can use it. Okay. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I do is try and tie the primary sources to the narrative thread. Okay. And, and I haven't got the actual, I've got, I've got the letter for you because I thought you don't want to read the letter okay so I thought well I'll show you the the slide I give them with the letter because I try and make sure they've all got either a digital or physical copy of the the passage that they need and you can do this for 
not just belief in idea in the Roman Republic, but you could do it for the Iliad, you can do it for invention of the barbarian, you can do it for love and relationships. Um, you know, you, you can sort of use the same uh, method, but also incorporate, you know, the sources and the scholarship that, that that particular module has to use. So, for example, here is Cicero, and we're, we're talking about the, uh, the letter to, uh, on its way to Epirus, to Atticus, in uh, July 59. Um, and I asked the students, read the letter to Atticus. They've probably done it once already for a pre-reading for homework. Make notes, somebody mentions the first triumvirate. Um, what offer did they make him? What was his reaction? And I say to them, I need evidence from the text. So don't just tell me, you know, what, where does he mention them? Tell me what he says. I actually want what he says. Or, you know, what offer did they make him? What was his reaction? I want the quote from the text. And you'll see why in a minute. So they do, you know, they do that. And it gives them some time to do that. So they're, they're anchoring themselves in the scholarship, in the narrative. Okay. Is you can, you can by doing that. So if I said summary, Cicero's feelings and fears. How reading the letter, how does Cicero feel about the situation? How do you think he feels about the Concordia Ordinum? Well, you know, his big dream of uniting the orders. But then below that, I have Goldsworthy and a quote from his biography of Caesar, and which is actually, again, if you were going to suggest a biography or par par parts of a biography for students to look at for this particular aspect. Goldsworthy is very readable. It's very user friendly. Um, and, and so it's, it's not so terrifying, but it's still got some good stuff in it. So, you know, Goldsworthy says here with the quote, the inertia at the heart of the Republic was alienating many citizens at all levels of society. With hindsight, many would see 60 as the year when the disease infecting the Republic became terminal. Now, that's a, that in itself, I think, is a good quote. And, and I always, when I teach, talk about the elastic band theory for the Republic, which is if you stretch an elastic band, you know, if you only do it slightly, it will go back to shape. The more you do it and the more often you do it, and the more force, more force you put in, the elastic band will never go back to exactly the same shape it was before you first started stretching it. So I try and tie the idea of scholarship to that. And when you read the letter to Atticus, uh, on the way to Epirus, he talks about, you know, people being silenced politically. And although they talk at dinner parties, his actual quote is that we are held down on all sides. He means by the triumvirate. He means by Crassus. He means by Caesar. He means by Pompey. So what I'm saying is you can take that letter and say, OK, we're held down on all sides. There's no political dissent. Um, he says at dinner parties, people talk about it. They talk about nothing else. But publicly, they don't because publicly there is no avenue for dissent. OK, and so if you if you look at the, the letter and you pair it with that, you have an argument all of a sudden, and an argument that is anchored to the narrative, which, you know, they, they should be going through each letter anyway. That's what the spec tells us. So anchoring the scholarship to it gives them a platform for an argument. Yes, I believe Goldsworthy was correct when he talked about, you know, 60 being a, a key year for the decline of the Republic. Look at this letter from Cicero. OK, um, look at what he says about the influence of the triumvirate. All of a sudden, you've got an argument, you've got a narrative, and it's something that they should feel confident because it's, it's anchored in the narrative. It's in the sources. But you've also given them these questions to answer along with the source and you know the more they write it down the more they think about it it's a bit like putting pieces of a jigsaw together the scholarship fits with the with the the source the source fits with the scholarship oh look i have an argument and it's it's a, it's not a way of saying oh look there's scholarship here you know what do we do with it should you know a lot of the accusations have been oh you have to learn it by rote well okay you know you you might have to know what goldsworthy says but you're not necessarily repeating it word for word. If you said Goldsworthy believes that the, you know, the disease infecting the Republic or the moment when the Republic ceased to be salvageable was 60 BC, then that's your scholarship. 
okay so it's not it's not as bad as oh they have to be able to quote this they don't they have to be able to anchor the argument from goldsworthy or whoever it might be and i think tying it to the actual sources you have to learn makes it part of the activity of every lesson every other lesson you know whenever it is that you're assessing um you know one of the sources that you are given and as i say you can i've used the republic here because it's the module which i teach on you know which i, I teach in its entirety i'm the only person who teaches the republic so i've got those examples but you can do that for any of the modules and i'll show you some examples from uh the, the iliad and and things like that and the Aeneid as we as we go along um as you say if I'm going too fast or or if there are any questions please do pop them in the chat by the way because I don't want to feel that anybody's sort of missed anything um as we go along but the, you know they're, they're just some of the things I I think are good ways of really anchoring your students because you start with the sources you know early on so it means you're tying it to the scholarship early on and the longer they have to do it the more comfortable they will get with it um so that's one way of doing it there are other ways of doing it and i think if you keep it sort of fresh so you do this you do do this sort of activity often but there's other things we can do that sort of switches it up a bit and gives them a bit of a different look at scholarship and i think i think this is important as well so that might just be an activity in the middle of a lesson you could do scholars as a starter so, for example, this is an extract from Tom Holland's Rubicon. It's about a page long ish. OK. Um, and so what what you might want to say scholarship, you can at the start, you could say, right, read this extract from Tom Holland, highlight the keywords or phrases which illustrate Holland's interpretation of an event. Now, because this is a starter, you can sort of give it different angles. Scholarship can be tied to the narrative thread by using it to talk about what we talked about last lesson. So, you know, it, it's sort of consolidating the key points of last lesson with some scholarship. OK, um, so that they're really sort of reinforcing. Oh, yeah, I think I understand that. Oh, yeah, right. OK, Holland, Holland is saying the same thing that we were talking about last week or, you know, or Tuesday or, or whatever it was. Or you can say, right, this is going to be the key focus for our current lesson. So here's what we're going to talk about. This is a scholar's view on it to give you sort of an anchor, uh, a sort of gathering point. Right. This is what we're going to talk about and then leap into the lecture itself and say, right, what what we're actually going to talk about, how good, how accurate, how fair do we think Holland's interpretation is based on what we're going to learn? And then you can come back to it at the end and say, right, Holland said this from what we've learned throughout this lesson. And what the sources tell us, is it a fair interpretation or not? And so then you've actually got the, the scholarship running all the way through the lesson, even though you've only picked it up at the beginning, uh, you know, to either consolidate the last one or to take you through this one. So scholarship as a starter can be useful. Again, um, I think it's, it's good if you get them to highlight the keywords and phrases, because, you know, if you say just read it, they don't, you know, they don't always take it in. So you should spend, you know, spend five, 10 minutes saying, right, what did you get? What sort of things did you highlight? What can you take from it? You know, and obviously I, I know you guys all know how to do that. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. But, you know, that's the, the sort of way that you can anchor it again in scholarship, but in a different way. OK, so as, as a starter to get us to get us really thinking about the the way we want to use the scholarship in this lesson for this particular purpose. OK, so scholarship as a scholarship as a starter works quite nicely as well okay um, and what i would say is also i try and scan as much as possible um, as well so if it's a case of access to scholarship i do try and scan them and i'm sure you guys do too um, and you know obviously jstor can be useful and, and things like that um, to get more scholars but you can build obviously building up a bank of scholarship and then uh, you have them sort of ready here's one i prepared earlier neil buchanan type job OK, so that's as a starter, but there are other ways you can do it as well. I think there are there are other things that you can look at. So one of the things I like to do is scholars as an essay. Um, so Silk believes so this is an Iliad example. Silk believes there is no romantic love in the Iliad. To what extent do you agree? And I normally put this out there as a as a as a 16 marker um, for 
for you know classics and for for the the first year module um and, and it's just a case of selecting a, a scholar's quote that you believe creates some tension so oh is there something we can actually disagree with here um and the students tend to really like this one because they go well no come on it's ridiculous andromache and hector surely surely that's a absolutely uh, the first point you should raise um and, and so you know they, they get sort of engaged with it but of course by doing that as an essay as like a practice they then have you know what michael silk thinks about love in the iliad um so that that's quite helpful even though they're answering the question and it is a question but it's also a bit of scholarship um and you know you can do one so the heroic code is another one i try and um try and think about edward's view on the heroic code is, is another scholarship essay question which i tend to use um and and you know that that also gives them then key a key quote on the heroic code and obviously that's you know one of the big things you can see across the entire narrative um so what i, what I try and do is when it's a scholarship essay title i'm trying to bolt the scholarship as it were even though i said don't use the term but i'm trying to weave the scholarship into the narrative so what are the big themes of the iliad okay the heroic code is one so an so a, an essay question that gives you a quote on um the heroic code is going to be useful for them to use okay but what it also does is it when they write the essay obviously they're going to be using the narrative from the text so again it reinforces that the scholarship should be woven in with the narrative okay and and that obviously will will put them right up there band six okay that's what we want so so scholarship as an essay title is another thing that i think is quite useful and something they get used to um and and again it doesn't make it scary it makes it ordinary i think if we can remove the fear from scholarship and make it ordinary just just another day in the classroom that is good because you don't want to say oh there is this big beast called scholarship oh we have to deal with it uh, and you know it, it can worry some students they hear the word scholarship they go oh my god the more we weave it in the more we make it commonplace the less panic there will be uh, about sort of deploying it in an exam it will just be the same thing they do every day or every week with with all of you okay so scholars and themes as i said um one thing I always say to this PowerPoint slide I use sometimes, I say it's a good idea to attempt to tie up various themes in the Aeneid. So at the end of the Aeneid um, module, I use scholarly quotes and I do a whole lesson on themes and scholars. So I take massive themes from the narrative and we talk about scholarship and arguments that you can you can build. Um, and it obviously it gives us different positions that you can take on these themes. So, for example, Stephen Harrison Aeneid. I said to him, Google that, you'll find Stephen Harrison, who is a respected scholar, talking about the Aeneid and various themes. Um, and you can use this as critic material or critical material in your essays. And what I did was I, I played them one, um, which was, is the Aeneid a propaganda piece? And I let them run it. And I said, look, it doesn't have to just be from a book. It doesn't have to just be from an article. If it's on Google, um, you know, if it's a, if it's if it's on YouTube and it's from a scholar, uh, you can use it. You don't have to say in the YouTube video. You just say Stephen Harrison believes. You know, um, the the other thing that now the CA have actually just done it popped up yesterday was the new podcast for the ancient history um, spec, and obviously they've got two scholars debating one another on a podcast. That's a perfect example. Some students love podcasts are big things at the moment. Students love podcasts. So say, so right, you've got the two names of those um, scholars. Use their arguments. Just note down then as you're going along, you know, on the bus or whatever, um, you know, get, get out your notes function on your phone and just go, right, okay, that's the name of that one. That's the name of that one. And he says this, she says that. You've got two scholars. You've got two scholars and the critical positions they adopt on an issue. Um, and, and so that that in itself is a very fine way of building up their scholarship without them looking like they're actually building up their scholarship. Scholarship by stealth um, in, in terms of podcasts or, or YouTube videos. 
Okay, it's not a big book. It's not scary. It's perfectly manageable. Um, so you know, th these are things I always um, try and tell them they should be thinking about. Um, okay, other things I I like to do. So this is this is a slide that I can use. I'll say okay. So so I'll be as noted, and then there's a quote. But that's not necessarily what I'm interested in. The quote is there. It all goes on our learning platform. They can access it any time. So they can go back and see the quote. But I'll say, right, can you prove it? Give me something from the text, from the Aeneid, that proves or disproves. And they'll, you know, they'll write the quote down and they'll write the, the material down they're going to use to support it. You're, you are building the, the blocks of actually, OK, I've written this down. I remember this argument. It makes more sense to me now than it did before. So the quote is there in this instance to pull out what they know. OK, and so if if they have to in class dispute or agree with a scholar and I've asked them to write it down, you're going to be more likely to remember it. If you write something down, you're always going to be more likely to remember it. So so th this, in a way, is 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 priming them to one room of the quote. But actually, if you know, if the theme comes up on uh, sort of a nationalist epic and the idea of Roman history, Roman values, they will have evidence to, to be able to do that, okay? And they'll probably remember that, you know, Sowerby's position is that it's preeminently nationalist, you know, in, in its outlook, okay? So that's another way of doing it. The, the quote here is just the launch pad for, for can you prove it, okay? Can you prove or disprove? Um, but, you know, and all these things are different ways of getting to think about it and, and, and write about it and be more confident with the positions that scholars adopt and take up. OK. Um, OK. Uh, OK. Um, so here are a couple more things. These are more fun. Um, sort of they're not they're not massive activities. Uh, this is called debate the statement. Um, and what we do here is we have. The four of these things, and I've got them animated so that I don't know if I if I can do that. Will it work? I don't know. Let me try. Uh, yeah. So obviously you you click it, and it and it appears. Um, and I'll normally do debate the statement at the end of a lesson. Uh, and so the things come up, and I say right, we're we're going to pick one, or I'll pick one for them, and, and we'll debate it. Um, and so you know that that's how sort of we we go about it sometimes i'll include scholars quotes in the debate the statement and it's expected i expect class to sort of begin sort of rolling with it and so you know somebody will say something and somebody will pick that up and say actually i agree or disagree and you know what you might think oh you know is that gonna happen you do it a couple of times and then you know first time they it might not be that successful but as they get used to it as they get more confident as the weeks go on they become more comfortable with one another they will, they, they do engage in this. And so, you know, for example, the bottom one there, the Iliad is merely a commentary on war. Uh, you know, Owen is one of the one of the best quotes to deploy here, where he says, you know, Owen talks about um, the idea of the Iliad and says, book six gives us the chance to lift our eyes from the battlefield and see a more human and, and real side of the participants uh, within the conflict. And so, you know, if you've already flagged Owen, in in a lesson or even this lesson when it's debate the statement this is your chance or this is their chance there's the the argument bring me something which either proves or disproves now of course they'll bring you stuff from the text as well but they can bring you that scholarship as well like if you've used the scholarship in the lesson they can bring that out and and you can bring it out for them as well you can say right okay well what did we learn about owen oh yeah okay lifting our eyes from the battlefield Thus, the Iliad is not merely a commentary on war, is one of the positions you can take. Um, obviously, that you know, it, 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 there are different arguments and you can use different scholars, but debate the statement I find really useful for building their confidence with arguments. And obviously, if you're already including scholars in your day to day lessons, they'll come through in the arguments. If they're confident with the arguments, they're confident with the narrative, they're confident with with debating the statement, they will bring the scholarship in. It might take a bit of prompting from you, but once the prompt, once you prompt, they'll go, oh, yeah, I remember that. Owen did say that about, about book six. 
or Edwards did say that about Agamemnon or whatever, you know, or love is an unnecessary distraction. Oh yeah, Silk did say there's no romantic love in, in the Iliad. I can use that. I can bring that to bear on, on my question. Um, and so it's about, I think it's about repetition and, and, and making it low stakes, low risk. Just, you know, tell me what, tell me what you think. Tell me why you think it. Bring in those scholars, you know, if you can, and nudge them to bring in the scholars. You know, if they're making the point that a, the scholar that you've talked about is actually used, say, well, what about, what about Joe Bloggs? Didn't he say that? Okay. And you, you, you're sort of helping them build those bridges, um, which I think, you know, is, is what we want to make it a, a sort of a low risk thing to do. Um, okay. Uh, one of the other things I like doing is, is basically like a jeopardy grid. So I've only filled in a couple of these, but normally it would be full. Um, and sometimes um, I do it in different ways. So Goldsworthy, Silk, Brunt are my scholars and then my themes. So, for example, I'd have had determinism or, or you know something else. And what you can do is sometimes I split the class into a group or teams, sometimes teams. But, uh, you know, it gets competitive and sometimes you have to wipe the blood off, off, off the floor. Um, you know, they get they get quite. Yeah, I want my point. I want to do, I want to beat the other team. Um, and so, you know, Goldsworthy, you might say, right, OK, tell me about Goldsworthy's position on. And, you know, if they successfully do that, their team wins a point. Um, or, you know, what is Silk's opinion of? OK, tell me, win a point. Um, or so what does Brunt think about uh, the rise of Latifundia in the Roman Republic? OK. Um, and so and so, you know, they get points. They get the point if they can accurately um, relay the position of the scholar. They don't have to quote it. It's not a memory exercise. It's a it's a formatting an argument and a structure exercise. OK, so it's the position that each one takes on the issue. Um, if they can quote it, wow, amazing. But if they if they know the position that that's fine, too. Um, and what you can also do then is down here, I've got determinism and its themes. Um, and so you'll say, you know, tell me about a theme. Um, can, is there a scholar you can use to support the theme? So it might be define the term and then give me a scholar. OK, um, and you can do this with all sorts of things. You can do it with basic facts. You can do it with bits of the narrative um, in, you know, if you were doing the Aeneid or the Iliad or something like that. And again, it, it's good to do as a team game because they get competitive. You know, they love to win. They love to beat the other team, um, but but it also allows everyone in the room to sort of be partaking in the scholarship without necessarily, uh, you know, all thinking, oh, I have to write, I have to write down this quote from memory, um, because you know the other team, you're all discussing it one another. You let them discuss. You say, right, okay, and so you're building those moments where they are referring to scholarship, where again it's a very low stakes. There's, there's, there's nothing on it apart from, you know, uh, apart, apart from, you know, everlasting glory, as I always I always say to the classics class, uh, is, is only chaos on the line, nothing big, you know, and, and they sort of feel, OK, I, I want, you know, I want to beat the other team. So I'm, I'm really going to go for this. Um, it's a fun starter. Um, it's a fun plenary as well, just as a, a sort of right. Let's end the lesson. Uh, you know, let's see where you are in terms of scholarship again. First time doing it might be a bit slow but the more you do it and the more they know what to expect it's it's a processes thing the repetition of the grid they see the grid second time they see the grid i say oh i've seen this one before i know how it works and these are all ways that you can bring in scholarship without going okay we've got to we've got to read this article or you know you've got to listen to this entire podcast and and make sure you've got it down it's it's little and often and it's actually there's nothing big on this if you if you don't absolutely nail it first time i think it's bringing across the fact that all of these activities will increase your confidence with scholarship so that you can take positions in essays and exams not so you can quote it by rote um or but so that you can tie it to a theme you can tie it to a person you can tie it to a uh you know an uh, an event okay or or a literary narrative um, that's what that's what the scholarship is for. And that's why I hope that 
these some of these activities some of these angles that you can take some of these resources help you but also help them build their confidence on it so that they can adopt positions not quotes on particular issues and events within um, the narrative um, i realize i've been waffling for a long time um, so i'm going to pause there and i'm going to ask if anybody has any comments queries or questions about any of this or just just anything you'd like to say in general feel free to unmute if you'd rather do that than write in the chat that, i mean yeah, absolutely. that was yeah that was brilliant danny thank you so much it was you definitely weren't waffling <laughs> there was lots of really really brilliant strategies there um, and we'd love to hear from more of you who've got some Sorry, uh, if you've got some suggestions that you'd like uh, to add or if you've got any questions and please feel free to, to do so now. If this were a lesson, I'd say don't all rush at once. <laughs> Nothing at all. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, go on once. I, I'll say something because I'm not your regular audience. I'm a home educator. Um, oh, cool. and, hi. And uh, one of the one things I do have found is difficult for is a starting point on the larger mark question. Sorry, I might not be up with all the terminology that's used yeah. in a edu standard education environment. But using scholarship as a starter, I think, is a brilliant idea. And that is one that hadn't actually occurred to me. Um, and so, you know, for me sitting here now, I'm really grateful for you introducing that as an idea. So thank you very much. Oh, you're very plus, welcome. Plus the other idea, I have a very, I have a, I have a younger child who's who's very academic and has started early, but I hadn't even thought of taking her down the um, route of YouTube and looking at modern scholars. Mm. I've just been keeping her in the classics world. So actually, this is another angle that I hadn't considered. So for me, I'm very grateful. Thank you. No problem at all. You're very welcome. okay yeah um okay no that's that's a good question so um i i have i have been you know in conversation with with um people teaching it in conversation with um people doing training they have always talked about the idea of two scholars being used because um you're you, i suppose what you're doing is you're you're building a foundation for your argument um so and and I think that that you know that's important to show different angles and different points of view. Um, I mean, obviously you've got to you've got to take and weave the narrative from the sources in there. But I've always taken it to be two sort two two scholars and 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 sort of the inference I've always had is that two scholars is is what you should do. Okay, we've got some agreement there. Also heard that, but not directly from OCR. Um, yeah, I, th I think for, for me, I've always, I've always, um, yeah, okay, for, yeah, three. I, I've always felt that was that was safe. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that you you should try and give them as as many arguments as you can, and it, and if that involves them using two scholars in the exam or using three or however many it might be, I, th I think you know a defined number is helpful sometimes, but you get into the how many paragraphs does it have to be narrative which is what you get sometimes when when you have an a-level class and they say you yeah, about how many paragraphs do you have to write so I, I i you know i say you need at least two that's what i always say to them you need at least two um okay there we go uh yes okay so you've heard it directly from from ocr um yes absolutely absolutely <laughs> spoiler yes quite spoilers um because because i'm because i think it's a it's a story I, I try and i try and treat it as like you know what's the narrative giving us i do try the the scholars i use i use it so that at that point in the narrative here is what the scholar is offering us um about this issue so i don't i try not to leap ahead with the scholarship um you know so that so that it doesn't as you say spoil the story like my my lot are currently really excited to find out what happens to Marcus Crassus because they know it's bad but they don't know what it is and so I have directly I've taken out all references to 
Crassus, you know, and the molten gold and all that sort of thing. And I won't use it until we get to that point because, but that's just, that's just something I do for, for you know, to, to keep them thinking about what, what might have happened to it. Um, uh, oh, as a teacher, sorry, as a teacher from, from Greece, I think it would be it. Classics, how can I start teaching classics? Would be great. Georgia, if you can email me directly, I can pick up with you on that one. Cool, okay. That's not, that's not that. I'll leave that one to you then. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I think I I I try and keep it spoiler free. Um, not everybody does that, but you know, like somebody will say to me, "Well, what happens to so and so?" and I'll be like, "Tune in next week." Uh, you know, come back next week, you'll find out. Um, because I think that that keeps them going. Uh, right. Okay. Um, now this this is a thing. Um, I have a huge bank of quotes uh, in Word documents that that I can sort of pick out from and this sort of thing. And I, I'd say to them, um, you know, yes, YouTube videos are good, but you have to make sure it comes from a, a respectable source. So they've all got their names on, you know, Dr. Dr. Joe Bloggs, Google him, Google them. OK, make sure they are they are somebody who is working in the field. Um, so we try and stay away from blogs. I try and scan as much of my scholarship as I can, uh, you know, scanning for the books that I own um, or the articles I've downloaded or whatever it might be and saying, here is some scholarship. So that because, you know, students are a bit, uh, sometimes they can be a, a sort of not as proactive as they, they might be. And, and, and the, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, well, you know, I, I didn't go looking for scholarship or so one thing I try and do is, not make make it easy for them to find the scholarship so there's I'll, I'll have a file on our on our teams page which is scholars or you know within the powerpoints there'll be scholarship on the for them to go looking for so i try and i try and eliminate the need for random blogs if that makes sense uh, I'm, I'm trying to point them in the direction of scholars which they can get from our from our page um from so and sometimes what i'll do is I'll find the YouTube video. I'll see one and go, oh, I like that. And I will chuck it on the page. I've got, so like on, you know, on my page, we've got Iliad, Republic, Greek theatre, uh, Aeneid. And there'll be another channel, which will just say classical stuff. And I will, I will put on there, oh, I've just seen this. This is good for you know, X, Y, Z. Have a look at it and put the link on there so they can go straight to it. They just click on it. They don't need, they don't need, I'm, they're doing as little work as possible for as maximum benefit. That, that's how I see that. If that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. I think we've got um, one question from Anya. Hey, um, I was just wondering the strategies you're mentioning, have yes. you tried them much with visual sources of uh, training from OCR and they've said you can use, students can use sort of paintings of art or even modern film or TV representations and reception as scholarship. Yeah. How easy do you uh, find using them? Like, I was wondering if you tried using them in the strategies that you're presenting today, and yes, how effective yeah. it was. Yes, I have, um, and and they do work quite well. Um, what what I would say is, I I have I I I cheat a bit in the fact that um, I'm I'm currently uh, sort of working on um, for for my thesis, like visual scholarship. So I tend to have a bank of all these images knocking about, which is which is quite lucky for me. Um, but I have I have tried them and they do work and, and they do they do like an image. I mean, like even not in the sense of visual scholarship, but they love a map. Like if you say, right, I'm going to show you a map and show you where all things are. Suddenly the scales fall from the eyes and they go, oh, yeah, I can see that. Um, so, you know, like Imperial Image, for example, it's all about coins. Uh, there's a lot of coins. Um, you know, there's the res guest, but there's a lot of coins as well. Um, and so statue busts and the, the prima porta Augustus and the, and 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 sort of you know contrasted with the with the Mallorca Augustus and, and so on and so on, but it, it I mean it works because but it will take you time. So the difference is say what you see. So what I would say to you there is give them the image. So scholarship is a starter. You give them the image, okay. You might then give them a passage of the Res Gesto, for example, which talks about, you know, um, Augustus as the son of Caesar um, and, you know, 
uh, the the idea that the comet from from the, the 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 games and what have you, and actually show them the coin and say, look, these things marry, these things match. So what you're doing there is you are weaving the literary source on top of the visual image to either support or um, or go against what is being said. Okay, and that and that so you you're, you're pulling the same trick, but just with a visual source. Does, does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, Danny, I'd like to thank you very much for delivering such a brilliant session. I think there's some really, really excellent strategies that you have shared with us this afternoon, and thank you for taking the time to put all that together. Um, so what I will do once we finish this recording and once Danny sent over his PowerPoint, Dan, if you're happy to share that with me, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Can, no problem. Um, send that out to all of you that have attended this afternoon. Um, but like I said, if you've got any more questions that you would like to ask Danny, then drop me a line and I can pass them on. Um, also, if you've got any more ideas for CPD sessions in the future, then please do let me know. Um, we have got two more sessions starting at 5.15, new to GCSE and new to A-level. Um, so perhaps I'll see some of you over on one of those calls. Um, but for now, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and I will email out all of this follow-up um, as soon as I can. Thanks, Danny. No problem. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody.